Kobla Khan or a vision in a dream, a fragment. This is the complete title of today's poem. Hello, how are you? This is Hina from Team Walad. Kobla Khan shall be discussed in such detail today that you will become master of this poetry. Written by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, a very important part of British literature series and of course UPHESC. Kubla Khan was composed in the fall of the year 1797. Composition date and publication date are far apart. Written 1797, not published before 1816. Yes, actually Coleridge did not want to publish it because according to him, it was just a fragment. It was incomplete. But then Lord Byron told him, publish it, publish it. So he did. So in 1816, it was issued in a pamphlet containing Christabel and the Pains of Sleep. Poet S.T. Coleridge, who lived from 1772 to 1834. The setting of this poem, of course, is dream. But in dream, what is the setting? It is Xanadu in Mongolia. Mongolia is like present day East Asia, you can say. Theme, major theme is poetical imagination. How the poets, you know, they can imagine for the sake of their creativity, to, where, to what lengths they can go for their creativity, that creative impulse, okay? Reality versus dream, the nature of paradise, time, all these are major themes of Kubla Khan. Genre, of course, Kubla Khan belongs to romantic literature. It is a dream poetry and it is fragmentary poetry. Total number of lines in Kubla Khan will be 54 and they will be divided into three stanzas but not regular. So three irregular stanzas containing total of 54 lines. Before I begin with the complete text of the poem, you should know the summary of it in a crux. So you can say Coleridge because he's calling it a dream poetry. He wrote Kubla Khan after seeing a dream. You know, Coleridge actually took opium because he had a lot of physical pain, mental pain, maybe to come out of it, he, yes, took opium. So during one night when he was reading a book about Kubla Khan, about Janadu, in Pilgrims by Samuel Purchase, remember it, this is an important question, Coleridge was reading a book by Samuel Purchase in which he was reading about Kubla Khan and Janadu, it was called Janadu, and he fell asleep. And finally, when he woke up, he could write this poem. But then he was interrupted in between by somebody, okay, this person, and he could not complete this poem. So originally, he wanted to write Kubla Khan with 200, 300 lines in it, but he could not. He ended up only writing 54. If we talk about the summary of Kubla Khan, you should know Kubla Khan was a Mongolian emperor and he was the grandson of the great Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan was the first Khan and also the founder of the Mongol Empire. Okay, This poem will describe Xanadu, which is the palace of Kubla Khan that he has built for himself because Kubla Khan is always fighting, wars, he's tensed. So as a summer house or a recreational place, he has built Xanadu. So poet or the speaker or Coleridge, you can say, calls Xanadu as a pleasure dome. He talks of a river that flows through this area. He talks of the fertile land that surrounds this palace of Xanadu. The speaker or Coleridge or poet will tell us about a canyon that, you know, through which a river flows around this surrounding area of Xanadu. Then he will talk about a woman who is wailing or crying for her demon lover. Then the poet will think of Kubla Khan. So Kubla Khan is standing here thinking about war, going to war as he listens to the noise of the river. This river is called River Alf. Then at the end, the speaker or Coleridge talks of a maiden playing dulcimer. Dulcimer is a musical instrument. And he will end the poem with the power of the creative impulse. What creativity can do to poet as well as to the people around, the people listening to this poetry. This is just in crux, I have told you. Now we are in a very good position to start with the poem Kubla Khan. Stanza one, let me read it to you first. In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf, the sacred river, ran through caverns measureless to man, down to a sunless sea. 
So twice five miles of fertile ground with walls and towers were girdled round and there were gardens bright with sinuous rills where blossomed many an incense bearing tree. And here were forests ancient as the hills enfolding sunny spots of greenery. Easy, very easy, I will explain it to you. The speaker says that Kubla Khan, the great warrior, ordered to build a pleasure dome for himself or a summer home in Xanadu. This palace is also called Xanadu. The area where it is built is also referred to as Xanadu, okay? River Alf runs through this area, which crosses deep caves and which ends into the deep and dark and sunless sea. The area of Xanadu covers 10 miles. We don't know the area of the sea. We don't know the area of the caverns or the caves. They are measureless, but we know the area of Xanadu. It was spread in 10 miles and it was built with walls and towers circling it. There were bright gardens around this Xanadu. There were twisty streams nearby. And also many scented trees and plants and flowers and forests surrounded Xanadu. Ancient forest, which was as ancient as the hills, it enfolded sunny spots of greenery, which means although the forests are very dark and deep, but there were spots of greenery here and there, sunny spots, all right? Xanadu is located in a valley surrounded by hills. So whatever I've told you, you understood the speaker or the poet is describing Xanadu, what is around Xanadu, what is in Xanadu. He talks of the forest, he talks of the caves or caverns, he talks of the sea, right? Easy. Can we move on to stanza number two? Here it is. Let's read it. But oh, that deep romantic chasm which slanted down the green hill athwart a sedan cover, a savage place as holy and enchanted as ever beneath a waning moon was haunted by woman wailing for her demon lover. And from this chasm with ceaseless turmoil seething, as if this earth in fast thick pants were breathing, a mighty fountain momentally was forced, amid whose swift half-intermitted burst huge fragments vaulted like rebounding hail, or shaffy grain beneath the thresher's flail, and mid these dancing rocks at once and ever, it flung up momentally the sacred river. Now the speaker or Coleridge says, that river Alf runs so violently down the hills. So there is Xanadu. Around this area, there are hills. And then there is a river, which is river Alf. River Alf runs so violently down the hill that it cuts a deep canyon between, like scissors, you know. It is cutting the hills and then there is a deep canyon formed. You know, canyon in between the river is flowing on the side. There are canyons. This hill is covered with cedar trees, cedar trees. Then the poet says, this indeed is a savage place, supernatural place, because the ghost of a woman is seen here. Woman wailing for her demon lover. She probably is a ghost. She does not exist. The sound of this woman crying for her demon lover, which means there is some evil spirit surrounding this place. Further, the poet says that the river rushes down the hillside at every moment. Momentally means at every moment, erupting like a geyser, hot water from the canyon. Imagine a river is rushing fast, it actually breaks through the rocks and water comes up like a fountain, but it is like a hot boiling water or it's like a geyser. Can you imagine it? That is the imagery which Coleridge actually wants us to see when we are reading the poem. So let me read it again. Coleridge says that this river rushes down the hillside at every moment, erupting like a geyser from the canyon. And when I see this scene, it feels like the earth is tired and there are pants. <laughs> The earth is panting. So the breath is literally this boiling water. The earth is panting. This fast and this breath, this fast and thick breath, like an animal, is this geyser, this hot boiling water. And next, 
another comparison is when river alf crushes through the rocks it feels like rain of hail or grain as if it is being separated from the shaft you know when the grain is separated from the shaft with a flail with a stick a thresher stick what happens the very light weighted a uh, shaft the very light weighted you can say a shaft it 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 actually flies up you know it flies up so it's it's that feeling that there's like a rain of hail or grain as it is being separated from the shaft do you understand can you imagine it literally like the parts of the grain are falling up and down when this river is crossing by okay easy stanza number 2 continues here Five miles meandering with a mazy motion through wood and dale, the sacred river ran. Then reached the caverns measureless to man, and sank in tumult to a lifeless ocean. And amid this tumult, Kubla heard from far ancestral voices professing war. The speaker, who is dreaming and then writing this piece. he says that river alf now moves in a zigzag motion look at the alliteration here miles meandering with a mazy motion murmur sound river ran roro sound then reached the caverns measureless to man there is like repetition of murmur sound roro sound it makes an alliteration here so the speaker says that the river alf moves in a zigzag motion through forest and valley where zanadu is located and from being fast and furious literally it was fast and furious right it was erupting geysers it was compared to these uh, hails this rain of uh, grain right but from being fast and furious now the river will slow down as it will calmly enter the area of zanadu so the origin is like fast but as it comes to zanadu this river flattens it comes to zanadu calmly crosses zanadu for 5 miles after which it reaches those caves remember the caves which are measureless to man it was spoken in the first stanza same caves so the river crosses these caves and after which it sings or melts in the calm ocean in the lifeless ocean and during all this time watching this river coming fast but then slowing down kubla might literally be standing in the balcony you can say of zanadu and kubla looks at this river with all its different variety this kubla khan the grandson of great jenghis khan he arises he looks at this river and he can literally hear the voices of his ancestors saying war time to go to war time to wage a war did you understand it yes with this this little bit of stanza from stanza 2 only is left let's read it the shadow of the dome of pleasure floated midway on the waves where was heard the mingled measure from the fountain and the caves it was a miracle of rare device a sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice finally you will find some rhyme scheme going on here look at the last words of each line pleasure waves measure caves device ice right a b a b c c yes can you device it good so now the speaker says that the big shadow of the zanadu this palace it floated on the waves of the river alf imagine there's a river flowing and there's a big palace or a big house how the shadow of it will fall into the river or the water same way the speaker says that this big shadow of zanadu floated on the waves of river alf and one could hear the sound of the fountain as well as the sound of the water crashing against the caves right indeed a miracle it is because zanadu was sunny as well as icy at the same time sunny pleasure dome and icy because of the caves of ice you know they are cold caves caves of ice literally does not mean that there will be ice inside the caves it means it will be cold because it is so dark it is so deep it is measureless caverns right so miracle zanadu is because it is sunny as well as icy sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice nice with this stanza 3 the last stanza of kubla khan begins a damsel with a dulcimer in a vision once i saw it was an abyssinian maid and on her dulcimer she played singing of mount abora could i revive within me her symphony and song to such a deep delight it would win me 
that with music loud and long, I would build that dome in air, that sunny dome, those caves of ice. Now you should know after stanza two, Coleridge is awake because he's disturbed by a person, but he has to complete the poem. So he gives a different ending to the poem, which might not be connected to what we've spoken till now. What does he say? The speaker says, Coleridge says that I once dreamt, this is another dream now, I dreamt of a young maiden from Abyssinia. Abyssinia is the modern day Ethiopia. So I once dreamt of a young maiden playing the dulcimer. She sang with her song about Mount Ebora. Mount Ebora is an imaginary place. Further, Coleridge says, if only I can listen to, to that song again, because her song had so much power when she was describing Mount Ebora. If only I could experience her music and song once again. Her music would you know, if I can revive that music again, what will happen? It will win over me. And with it, I could build Xanadu myself in the air. Till now, Xanadu was in my dream. It was built by Kubla Khan. But if I can get the music of this maiden, I can build Xanadu myself. How? Through my poetry. You know how poets have the power to build everything with their words, with their rhymes. That is what Coleridge says, because he is afraid of losing his poetic imagination. So in Kubla Khan, he's saying that my poetic imagination is going to be so great, so, so nice that I can build Xanadu and these pleasure domes by myself, those icy caves, that sunny dome by myself with my poetry. Last few lines of Kubla Khan. And all who heard should see them there. And all should cry, beware, beware. His flashing eyes, his floating hair. Weave a circle round him thrice. And close your eyes with holy dread. For he on honey dew hath fed and drunk the milk of paradise. Now the speaker includes the people who will hear this poetry of his. How the people will react to such a great imagination. The speaker says, when people will hear my lofty poetry, lofty, no, as in like, you know, this great poetry, they will get in awe of me and my poetic genius. They will imagine him. We don't know who is him there. It might be Coleridge himself or it might be Kubla Khan. It's ambiguous. So Coleridge says, they will imagine him and shout in reverence, beware, beware, he's a very strong spirit. They will literally join their hands. You know, they will close their eyes with a holy despair. They will encircle this spirit, either Coleridge or Kubla Khan, with three circles, three times they will circle him so that they cannot go close to this strong spirit. Because why? He has eaten honey dew and he has drank the milk of paradise. Basically, he has had the taste of paradise. He has become so strong that be away, beware, beware from this man. I feel it is uh, Coleridge. What do you think? You can comment. Theme, of course, is creative genius. How did you like it? This is Kubla Khan, the great poem. We hear so much about it, and today you know all about it, right? Meter. Two types, iambic tetrameter and iambic pentameter are used in Kubla Khan. Form ABB, AACC in some parts, whereas couplets in others. Points to ponder for examination point of view, all this is important. Coleridge, you know, begins or belongs to the older generation of romantic poets along with William Wordsworth. Coleridge was very much interested in the supernatural or fantasy or imagination in his poetry. And as I told you at the start, his plan was to write at least two to 300 lines in Kubla Khan, but he ended up writing only 54 because he was interrupted by a person on business from poor luck. This phrase has now become so important that if somebody disturbs you and you get interrupted in your genius when you are doing something, so that person is called a person from poor luck. Okay, a person from poor luck disturbed me. And as I told you again, Lord Byron it was who encouraged Coleridge to publish Kubla Khan after all those years. Kubla Khan along with the rhyme of the ancient mariner and Christabel are Coleridge's three great poems because of which he's remembered today. And the manuscript, the original manuscript of Kubla Khan is permanently kept at the British Library in London. 
Coleridge usually dated all his poems except for Kubla Khan. And there is one important historical figure who visited Xanadu in real, in person. This historical figure is Marco Polo. And Mount Abora, about which this maiden sang on her musical instrument, may refer to Mount Amara, which is considered to be the source of River Nile, as mentioned in Milton's Paradise Lost. Okay? Did I make sense? I did. If I did, you have to comment down, share our video, Kubla Khan, with your friends and relatives. And of course, subscribe to our channel, Walat by Dr. Kalyani Walat. This is Hina from Team Walat. Take very good care of yourself. Bye-bye.